All right, hello and good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. On behalf of the California Department of Veterans Affairs, the California Transition Assistance Program, and Bergman and Moore, we'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on burn pit exposures and presumptive conditions. We have um, quite a bit of information to go over today in a relatively short period of time, uh, but we're excited that you joined us today and we are going to um, you know, hopefully present this information to you um, and give you some valuable tools and resources regarding your California veterans benefits and information on presumptive conditions related to burn pit exposure. So with that, we will go ahead and get started. Um, before we begin, we'd just like to go over some general housekeeping items for uh, this presentation. We do ask if you are not a presenter to please uh, keep your cameras turned off and your microphones muted. This just kind of helps eliminate some of the distractions and saves on bandwidth uh, for the presentation. We have um, a lot of registered attendees today, um, so we just kind of want to make sure that we're getting through the presentation um, uh, without any um, challenges um, or issues. Uh, so please just keep that in mind to keep your cameras off and your microphones muted. As far as the agenda goes today, we will be doing an overview of the California Transition Assistance Program um, and some of the benefits and services available to veterans and their family members here in the state of California. We will also um, have our local interagency network coordinator um, speak about a little bit more about regional resources um, that CalVet offers uh, regionally throughout the state. And then we'll be joined by our guest speaker, um, Andrea McDonald with Bergman and Moore, who's gonna give a great presentation um, on the presumptive conditions related to burn pit exposure. Um, after the conclusion of the presentation, we will um, allow some time for a questions and answers panel. Uh, now we do request that if you do have questions and we anticipate that there's gonna be some questions today, to please use that chat feature on your um, Zoom account. There we go. Um, so if you're not familiar, um, just to use that chat feature and you can direct those questions to the CalTAP questions tab. Um, my colleague on the other end will uh, receive those questions and he can either answer them on the spot for you or just hold them till the end of the presentation and address those to the appropriate subject matter expert. So please use that chat feature if you do have questions. So um, we'd like to just begin by doing an overview of our program, which is CalTAP, the California Transition Assistance Program. And I'd like to introduce myself again. My name is Derek Rose. I'm a training coordinator um, for CalTAP. So I'd like to be able to go over um, exactly what the program is and some of the work uh, that CalTAP does here in the state. So what exactly is CalTAP? Uh, the program is designed to inform and connect veterans of all eras to their earned federal and state benefits. Um, and we do recognize that um, not all veterans have, you know, the same needs um, as those needs change over time. So what we've done is we've created our pathways program. As you can see, each one of those key areas that we've created pathways on, anything from core curriculum, which is essentially Veterans Benefits 101. It's your health care. It's your uh, disability claims. Um, it's your, your records requests. It's um, basically your starting point for all VA services, as well as our education, employment, and entrepreneurship pathways, as well as our service providers pathways. So if your transition or a, a veteran's transition or even their family members is, um, it's gonna be taking them into any one of these key areas. We designed um, really user-friendly self-paced learning modules on our website to help you navigate each one of those paths. And we're gonna show you a little bit on how to navigate that here coming up. Um, First, I'd also like to give a plug to our California Veterans Resource Book. This is a great tool to keep handy if you don't have a hard copy. Definitely recommend to go on our website and download a PDF version. We can also put this in the chat function for you as well, so you can download and keep a copy. Um, this is just a really great tool to keep handy. It's basically a listing of all your veterans' benefits from A to Z, all of your federal benefits, your state benefits, local, county resources as well. It goes all over all of the eligibility requirements regarding disability compensations, home loans, education programs. So it's really all encompassing tool and highly recommend you keep a copy of it um, if, if you can download it. 
So to kind of find our program on our website and kind of navigate some of our resources. So this is CalVet's homepage, calvet.ca.gov. And our program right there, as you can see highlighted with the yellow icon, is the CalTAP program. So if you clicked on CalTAP, that will bring you to our main page, which highlights each one of those pathways that I mentioned earlier. Um, I'd also like to make a mention of that yellow icon um, kind of at the bottom. That is our series of archived webinars. So um, over the last, oh gosh, I'd say about 18 months or so, um, we have done a whole uh, new series of online webinars that are very topic specific. Um, we still cover each one of our pathway programs, um, but we've uh, designed a whole series um, that just like I said, topic specific from um, mental health uh, services to education webinars to home loan webinars. So it's really a way for you to go back um, and kind of view some of the work that we've been doing. And we've archived all of those on our website. So if you'd like to refer to our website in the future, or when you have some time, I uh, really encourage you to go to our series of ICAR archived webinars uh, to learn a little bit more. Um, so this is a slide uh, for the VA claims process. If you want to get started um, with actual uh, disability claims, um, we have all of this information um, right here on our website, um, kind of our, our, our key um, areas uh, regarding veteran services and some of the ways that CalVet can assist. So if you just wanted to go on that VA claims um, link, and that'll um, give you all of the resources for how to file for disability, anything related to um, presumptive conditions, which we're going to be covering today, and some of the work uh, that CalVet does in relation to um, claims assistance at our district offices, as well as information on your county veteran service office, which is really going to be the key starting point for filing any of your disability claims or any services or benefits from the VA, um, the, the CVSO is a great resource for you. And we're gonna share um, a little bit on how to find, find that as well. So just keep that in mind. So how to actually use CalTAP online, I just kind of went over uh, that slide right there. Um, but going back to our uh, pathways page, um, you know how I mentioned the core curriculum, which is basically, like I said, Veterans Benefits 101. Um, but for today, we kind of want to focus, of course, on um, the claims and compensation module, which is module four, as well as module five, which is the California benefits overview. And we're going to do a run through of that um, real quick before we dive into our topic. So exactly what are uh, California veterans benefits and, and um, exactly what am I entitled to and how do I apply? So again, all of this information is in the um, veterans resource book. Like I said, it's federal benefits and it also covers your state benefits, of course. So I'm gonna refer to this a few times throughout the day, um, but just to show you a snapshot of where you can find all of this information um, if you have any more questions in the future. So one of our main um, programs and most popular benefits that we offer is a college and tuition fee waiver for veterans dependents is what that should say. Um, and so that waives tuition and fees at any state funded school, which is a UC, CSU or California Community College, all the way through that student's doctorate if um, eligible. So the only requirements is that the veteran um, needs to have a service connected disability from the Department of Veterans Affairs and that student needs to be a California resident. Um, if that eligibility is uh, fulfilled, then that student could attend tuition free at any state school. Um, as you can see right there, it saves California veterans several millions of dollars a year in tuition. Um, so if you have children or family members who are approaching college age and you are a service connected disabled veteran, uh, keep this benefit in mind because it be, could be a great benefit going forward. DMV programs, we partner with DMV on a few different programs. Uh, most commonly is the veterans uh, designation on the California ID or driver's license. This just allows you to print the word veteran on your driver's license. It's a way to show your veteran status um, out in town to kind of get all those local resources and benefits and discounts um, for, for being a military veteran. It's also a way for you to um, show your veteran status without having to carry around an old copy of your DD-214 in your pocket everywhere you go. Um, there's the Honoring Veterans License Plate Program. This is actually available to all California motorists. It's not just a veterans um, program. This just allows you to have a personalized plate from DMV that says 
honoring veterans on the license plate. And it's and it uh, also allows you to customize or personalize your license plate with a logo or emblem from your branch of service, from your period of service, a certain campaign that you may have worked on on your vehicle. There's also the motor vehicle registration fee waiver. Now this benefit is uh, solely reserved for veterans with a significant service connected disability that impairs their mobility. So this does require um, a physician to make that determination um, as well as submitting the appropriate form to DMV and signing off on, on the DMV's form. So that's just some high level um, FYI for you. So if you do have that eligibility or you want to find out more, um, please contact your county veteran service office because they're going to be the ones to certify for all of these benefits. Outdoor activities. California is a great place for recreational activities. Um, you can qualify for a reduced fee on your hunting and fishing license for disabled veterans, as well as what is called a Distinguished Veterans State Parks Pass. If you have a disability rating that is 50% or higher, you could qualify for no cost use of all basic state park systems um, statewide. You would just simply apply through this through the California um, Department of Parks and Recreation, and they will go over your eligibility and your veteran status and they will send you that card if eligible. Tax programs, there is the Disabled Veteran Property Tax Exemption. This is for totally 100% um, uh, service-connected disabled veterans. Um, if you have that eligibility, you can apply through your county assessor's office to where you pay your property taxes from, and you could qualify for a certain exemption amount up on your property taxes. Each exemption amount is different based on the county and assessed property values in that area. Um, but if you do have that eligibility, highly encourage you to reach out to your local office so they can apply the eligibility if you do own your property. Um, the business license tax and fee exemption, if you wanted to sell any goods or products or services and you needed a business license to do so, you could apply through your local issuing office, whether it's city or county or whatever you apply for that license from. And uh, you could see if they could honor that exemption for you. And the Disabled Veteran Business Enterprise Program, I would classify this more under our entrepreneurship pathway. Um, but what that is, it is a state certification, as you can see that acronym DVBE, and that is a certification you can attach to your business that will allow you to do business with the state of California and um, be successful in procurement opportunities if you wanted to sell your goods or services back to the state of California. CalVet Home Loans, another one of our great programs that we offer here at the state. Um, that is a, it, it's a home loan program that uses your VA home loan eligibility. However, CalVet is actually the lender on your home loan, as opposed to going through a private um, mortgage lender, CalVet actually services your loan. Um, what that does, it can provide full financing for veterans. They have competitive interest rates um, as opposed to the private lending market. And oftentimes there's low or no down payment requirements. Um, we have a great home loans team who's completely um, non-commission based at our office in Sacramento. So if you are interested in home ownership and you do have your VA home loan eligibility, we wanted to at least give this information to you if you're considering home ownership here in the state of California. CalVet Women's Veterans Division provides information, advocacy, and outreach to all California women's veterans. Um, they also work in direct partnership with the California Women's Veterans Leadership Council, and they actually manage the California Women's Veterans roster, which is a great way for women veterans to connect and network, whether it's other women who are um, business owners, entrepreneurs, or, or mentors, or just really establish that network, which is uh, so important in the veterans transition process. Uh, that is their contact information on our website on how to reach out to them directly and a little bit more about some of the work that they do. As well as our CalVet Minority Veterans Division, again, advocacy, outreach, and support to all the California minority and underserved veterans. Um, a key aspect of this program is to help unnaturalized, vet unnaturalized veterans with Cal uh, in California with citizenship and naturalization services. So if you'd like to reach out more, uh, find out a little bit more about some of the work that they do and who they serve. Um, that is their email address and contact information on our website as well. CalVet Homes for long-term care. Uh, CalVet operates eight veterans homes in the state of California. And these homes provide long-term care and services 
uh, for veterans offering medical, dental, uh, pharmacy, rehab, and social activities. They have provide all levels of care from independent living all the way through skilled nursing facilities. So I know, um, uh, you know, maybe, maybe not be on your radar right now. It, it, it may be, or you know somebody who may be eligible. I uh, just wanted to give you this information and you can see where each one of these um, eight locations are located in the state of California. State cemeteries, you may be familiar with the, the National VA Cemetery Administration um, nationwide, but CalVet also operates three state cemeteries and you can see where those are located in the Central Coast and Seaside um, at our Northern California Veterans Cemetery in Shasta County in Redding, as well as our Yountville Veterans Home Cemetery in Napa, California, which is um, solely reserved for uh, residents of the Yountville Veterans Home as well. So some common veteran websites that you may have come across or may be familiar with or, or not. Um, so VA.gov, they have a similar kind of portal system with their services. Um, anything from healthcare, uh, disability claims, um, to, to records requests, as well as applying for um, your benefits, um, whether it's education benefits or um, veteran readiness and employment benefits as well. So that is just a good starting point for the federal VA services. Um, this is eBenefits, which is a great way for you to track and manage all of the benefits you are receiving. You can print out your uh, certificate of eligibility for your home loan. You can track your GI Bill payments and eligibility, and you can also file for disability compensation or other uh, benefits uh, through the VA. Um, you, of course, are, are welcome to do all of that on your own, but we always recommend working with an accredited veteran service representative to assist you um, in any claim that you're filing to the VA. This just allows you to have proper representation on your claim. Um, so if you ever needed to appeal a decision from the VA for any reason, um, you have that proper representation. But this is a great way for you to kind of stay on top of everything that you're receiving, e-benefits. My Health EVET, if you have decided to receive your health care uh, through the VA, this is a great way for you to um, refill your prescriptions, schedule appointments, message your primary care physician, and maintain all of your health records as well. So My Health EVET, um, it's a really user-friendly portal um, that veterans can use as well. So um, I know we kind of covered a lot in just a brief period of time, um, but if you would like to stay connected with CalVet and CalTAP, here are some options for you. Um, so you can always just send us your email address. Um, if we have anybody on here who is you know, still active duty or still using their DOD address, we do ask that you send us your non-DOD email address. Um, there is going to be a a uh, webinar uh, survey that's gonna be sent out towards the end of the presentation. We have uh, definitely encourage you to, we please ask that you fill that out um, to kind of give us some feedback on today's presentation. You can register for MyCalVet on our website to stay up to date on benefits and services. And you can attend our webinars and follow us on our social media platforms or Eventbrite to stay up to date on everything that's happening with CalTAP. So that is my contact information. Uh, my name is Derek Rose. It's been a pleasure. Um, we really thank you for joining us and I will go ahead and move forward. At this time, I would like to introduce Annette Holover, who is the Central Valley link. Um, so she can speak a little bit more about some of the services uh, that she offers regionally in the state. So with that, Annette, feel free to take it away. Oh, thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Annette Wolliver. I am the link. So basically I am a field rep for the state of California, one of eight, um, and we work with federal and state agencies to ensure that you're educated and updated on all your benefits. Next slide, please. So you can see CalVet has divided the state into eight regions. Each color is a region with a coordinating link. Um, I'm the one in the middle of the Central Valley. I cover state of Florida Kern counties representing about 144,000 veterans, but we also represent all current and prior military service members and their families. And there's 1.6 million veterans here in the state of California. And us links work as a team uh, that, so we know our federal and state agencies and benefits that are available to you, but we also work independently within our regions. Uh, we build up our network of resources. Next slide, please. 
So we provide outreach to service members, veterans, and their families. And we do this by uh, going to DOD installations. I go to Lamar uh, Naval Air Station or uh, are doing webinars now. Uh, do work with the community colleges because typically these are recently separated veterans. Um, and we make referrals and work directly with established service provider networks. So what we do is in our communities within my eight counties, um, I actually build, I, I call them auxiliary benefits or services or agencies that can assist veterans and their families when perhaps maybe federal and state agencies do not have that ability. And then we also assist with local emergencies. Um, we've been very active in assisting the local assistance centers throughout the state of California uh, with the uh, fire evacuees. Um, last year, I actually was deployed to the Tulare LAC to assist SQF fire evacuees and assisted with the Creek fire evacuees. And in some cases, not only were these uh, military service members where their properties were destroyed, but also their paperwork. And that D Form 214 is a very essential piece of paperwork. Make sure you have a copy that you can refer to if you need it. But by working with the County Veterans Service Office, we were able to recover copies of the DD Form 214. And then also working with CalVet Home Loan Agent, um, able to secure a certificate of eligibility so they could go forward with a CalVet or a VA home loan. And if they had a CalVet home loan, we were there to assist them with their paperwork. Currently, um, the eight links of us, are, we're being fielded the calls that go into 1-800-CalVet headquarters. Um, so whether I get a call from San Diego or Klamath Falls, because I know the state and federal resources available, I'm able to assist them. And if we need to dive deeper into their community specifically, I contact their link because they are the subject matter experts. And then we provide leadership and advocacy to local communities by being in touch with our collaboratives, um, attending these meetings, building that network. Uh, we wanna ensure that uh, everyone is, uh, knows their benefits, if there's any changes or upgrade to benefits, or if there's any gaps in benefits that we can forward up to headquarters for review. Next slide, please. So we want to, as Link, get you connected to your benefits. And I'm the poster child for getting connected to your benefits. Um, I was a United States Army veteran from 1975 to 1978. Um, and I used my GI Bill, got my degree, um, and uh, used my VA home loan, and I thought that's it. But it wasn't until 11 years ago when I started working for the state of California, I realized I could file for compensation. And I wasn't even sure what kind of compensation I could file for. Um, so these agencies, on this page assist veterans with getting connected to all their federal and state benefits. The Employment and Development Department, uh, these are dedicated staff, EDD vet reps, I was one for eight years, that assist veterans with getting uh, either resume um, uh, information, uh, interview preparation skills, or just being connected directly with employers. And they are co-located in the America's Job Center of California, uh, these facilities actually have the tools that you can use at no cost to you, whether it's printers, copiers, scanners, fax machines, um, and they can assist you with your job search as well, with job boards, getting you uh, information on your veterans preference points, which goes a long way in the state of California. Uh, California state benefits, well, that's what CalVet is all about. Um, and I always say we are the other VA because uh, every state has different uh, benefits and eligibilities but it's the County Veterans Service Offices, the CVSOs. These are the boots on the ground. Uh, these are the administrators of many of the benefits that you're eligible for, and they can assist you in getting all the information you need, whether it's filing for compensation or pension, DMV paperwork, uh, fishing game, or the college tuition fee waiver. Healthcare, we should be very mindful of our healthcare during this time. Um, so the VA medical centers and clinics and vet center, if you want to, uh, uh, apply to uh, get services from these uh, institutions, um, you can either go online and uh, apply, or you can actually call eligibility at one of their offices and they can actually get you uh, uh, enrolled online. I know I get my healthcare through uh, the VA Medical Center here in Fresno and uh, it's been unbelievable. And they're doing things via telehealth and VA Connect. So it makes it very easy for you to stay in touch with the healthcare services that are available to you. So take advantage of all these agencies. Next slide, please. So if you remember nothing else, uh, remember my contact information. Um, I'm there to assist you if you need any 
any help at all, if you need to get in touch with a link in your area, um, I can reach out to them for you. So uh, thank you for your service and thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you, Annette. Thank you for joining us. Appreciate all of the information. Uh, so at this time, I would like to introduce Andrea McDonald, who is with Bergman and Moore. Andrea is an Associate Director of Education and Programs at Bergman and Moore. She's a proud wife, daughter, granddaughter, and sister-in-law of veterans. Andrea previously worked as an attorney at the Board of Veterans Appeals, where she served in many roles, including with quality review, legislation, regulation and policy, and the office of the chairman. She also worked on many aspects of the board's implementation of the Veterans Appeals Improvement and Modernization Act. Andrea graduated from Vanderbilt University with a bachelor's in history, and she earned her law degree from William & Mary School of Law. So Andrea, thank you so much for joining us today. And if you are ready, the floor is yours. Great. Well, good morning, everyone or good morning to you. I'm out in Maryland, so it's the afternoon for me. Today, we are going to be talking about um, a little bit about presumptive service connection in general in claims for VA compensation and then focus on the new burn pit presumptives. So next slide. So to start with a quick overview here of our agenda, we're gonna spend a little bit briefly going over the basic concepts of direct service connection. Then we'll spend most of our time in our second section talking about the new presumptive service connection for those who were exposed to burn pits. And then I'm gonna end with a little bit about um, strategies for meeting and talking with accredited service officers in pursuing a claim for VA benefits. So next slide. Go ahead and do the next slide. So we'll start by looking at direct service connection. So this is kind of, you know, the default um, normal claim, uh, just a general claim for a service connection for VA compensation benefits. So a veteran must establish that a disability is service connected before they may begin to receive uh, VA benefits and usually before they can receive VA health care. So there's three basic elements to the normal direct service connection claim. That's the present disability that the veteran has some sort of current um, diagnosis an in-service incident or accident, that's that something happened in service, and what's called a, ne a nexus, um, which is really just a connection between the first two things. So in most circumstances, the veteran must prove all three of these elements in order to win their claim and to establish that their disability is service connected. Let's look at the next, those three elements real briefly. So the next slide. So first is the present disability. So usually the best way to establish this is for there to be a medical diagnosis of a disability. So if a doctor can say, you know, you have arthritis or diabetes or hearing loss. Um, but in some situations, symptoms alone can be a disability. The catch is that those symptoms have to cause what's called functional impairment. So let's say like you have pain in your knee that a doctor hasn't really diagnosed as arthritis or anything else yet. The pain itself can be a disability for VA purposes, but that pain has to interfere with your ability to use your knee. So, you know, because of the pain in your knee, you um, can't walk as long or stairs are difficult, something like that. Um, so symptoms resulting in functional impairment or a diagnosis is required to establish the present disability. I wanna note though that exposure alone is not a disability. The veteran said has to show that there was a disability caused by this exposure. So for example, there's not a present disability of Agent Orange or um, of burn pits. You know, sometimes veterans try to just claim service connection just for burn pits. They really need to show that whatever that exposure in service, it caused some sort of disability. So either a medical diagnosis or um, symptoms that are uh, currently present. Next slide. The next element is to show that there was an in-service incident. That is that there's something that happened in service. Um, so this can be an accident or a specific injury, an IED explosion, a motor vehicle accident. 
or it could be something more general, like the general rigors of service, you know, carrying all of that equipment and marching for long distances, um, you know, all of these things cause wear and tear on the body. Um, it can also be some other events that resulted in the disability. Um, and the best way generally to show that there was some sort of in-service incident is to look for documentation in either your service medical records or your service personnel records. That's the best evidence you're gonna have that something happened in service, but it's not required. So if that incident wasn't documented in any of you know, records generated by DOD, um, then the veteran can still attempt to develop other evidence to show that the incident happened. So the veteran can submit lay statements on their own. You can get, it's called buddy statements, you know, people um, who are in the military with you that might've witnessed the event um, or loved ones who might've, you know, observed uh, the symptoms starting. Um, so any of those things, something or is the evidence to show that just something happened in service. And next slide, please. The third element is what's called nexus. This is showing the connection between whatever the current medical diagnosis is and whatever that thing is that happened in service. Now, this is the element where most veterans lose their service connection claim. So in most cases, this nexus or connection comes from a medical professional who's reviewed the veteran's uh, records and situation and can give um, an opinion with an explanation about why they say these things are related. So, you know, if possible, the veteran should look like to get an opinion from a doctor. If they're able to have access to a doctor um, who could write some sort of letter for them, that's the best option. But in many cases, once the veteran applies for VA disabilities, VA will help the veteran by providing them with the examination. Um, so VA will have, uh, usually, have someone look at the veteran um, to provide an opinion about this nexus. So that's the way you generally um, establish a claim for direct service connection. It's the three elements required. But now we're gonna look at an alternative way to establish service connection, which is presumptive service connection. So next slide. And the newest category of presumptive service connection is for veterans who were exposed to burn pits during their service. So go ahead to the next slide. So as a general overview for presumptive service connection, this is for veterans who have qualifying service. So they served in a um, certain region during a certain time frame, and a qualifying health condition. Then if presumptive service connection applies, it removes the need to show that third element, that nexus element. And instead, um, VA will just automatically grant that their current qualifying health condition was due to that qualifying service. So that's a general overview. We're gonna use the example of burn pits to explain more what I mean. So next slide. So first is general background as to burn pits in the Gulf War theater, um, plus some other deployment areas. Service members were often instructed to dispose of waste and trash in huge burn pits. Um, so they threw all kinds of things into these giant burning fires it had plastics, um, all kinds of toxins. The fires were really, really hot, so that smoke, fumes, toxic pollution, all of those things are um, what the veterans breathed in while they were during their deployment. The Public Health Department of VA acknowledges that veterans may have experienced health effects related to all of this exposure, all of these things that they were breathing in. Um, and there's a link there, it should be the blue words on your screen, links to VA's Public Health Department website for more information about that. <coughs> Such as the general background on burn pits. Next slide. As it applies to the new presumptions, we're gonna look at, there's actually two different presumptions at play. So one is for veterans who had qualifying service, so who served in specific areas during specific times, they're gonna be have presumed to have been exposed to burn pits. So that means VA will assume during their deployment to that area, they breathed in all those toxins. The second is for veterans who have, I'm so sorry, my throat <coughs> is all of a sudden dry. Ooh. Veterans who have a qualifying health condition can also benefit from the presumption of causation, which proves that nexus element. 
So VA can grant the veteran's claim by using one or both or neither of those presumptions like we're gonna look at. So next slide. So these are the veterans who are presumed to have been exposed to burn pits during their service. It's any veterans who served in Southwest Asia, it's commonly referred to as Gulf War veterans. It includes the countries on the screen, Iraq, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Qatar, the UAE, Oman, and also some bodies of water, the Gulfs of Aden, Oman, Persian Gulf, and the Arabian Sea and Red Sea, and also the airspace over all of those countries. So anybody who was in that general region at any time after August 2nd of 1990, that group of veterans will be have presumed to have been exposed to burn pits during service. Plus, they also added veterans who were deployed to Afghanistan, Syria, Djibouti, or Uzbekistan at any time on or after September 19th of 2001. So those new countries have a different um, period. And again, this includes all of the airspace over those areas. So this map is from VA, but I think even that's incomplete because it's missing Syria and I think Uzbekistan. Um, but any veteran who served in these areas will count for the presumption of exposure. And I also wanna point out, there's not a um, time requirement here. So any veteran who was in any of these places for um, any length of time during their service counts. So you don't necessarily have to have been deployed here. You could be TDY or maybe have visited for you know, whatever other reason. Um, if you were in any of these areas for even a day, then that counts as being presumed exposed to burn pits. Uh, next slide. I also want to note that so far there's no end date to these presumed exposures. So the Persian Gulf War officially began on August 2nd of 1990, and that period of war for VA purposes continues to this date. So um, anyone who served in the Persian Gulf War can benefit from this presumption. And even though the US mostly withdraw from Afghanistan earlier this summer, neither Congress nor the president has yet ended the Persian Gulf War for VA and healthcare purposes. So if a veteran or any service member is deployed to any of those countries on the previous slide, even tomorrow, um, they would count for uh, these presumed exposure to burn pits because there hasn't been an end date for them yet. Okay, next slide. Okay, so that was the presumption of exposure to burn pits. Next, we're gonna look at the presumption of causation. So this applies only to these, right now, only to these three qualifying health conditions, which is asthma, rhinitis, and sinusitis. Um, you can go ahead and next slide. So for veterans with qualifying service who were on the countries listed a couple slides ago, who were presumed exposed to burn pits, if they are diagnosed with one of those three health conditions and they had symptoms start within 10 years of the date of their separation from military service that includes the qualifying period of service. So whatever the date they separated from the period when they had that qualifying service to one of those countries, then they have a clock for 10 years for the symptoms to start. So note that there is this 10 year clock. If you're familiar with some of the other Gulf War presumptions, um, there's not the, the cutoff for, period for those conditions to start. There is for these new burn pit presumptions. If a veteran um, had qualifying service more than once, if you were deployed to one of those areas like twice, um, this clock would start from your most recent service. So whatever your separation from your more recent deployment, um, you would get the 10 years from there. And this doesn't necessarily mean you have to be diagnosed within those 10 years, but the symptoms have to uh, manifest. The symptoms have to have started. Um, so even if you're more than 10 years out from your separation from service, that would have been qualifying service, you could still get the benefit of this presumption just as long as you can show that you started having the symptoms of your asthma, rhinitis, or sinusitis uh, within those 10 years. Okay, next slide. So these new VA presumptive regulations became effective on August 5th of this year. 
They include all claims that were pending before VA or a federal court on this date. So if you or your veteran you're working with already has a claim pending for service connection for one of those three disabilities, and it's anywhere in the system, if it's waiting for a board decision, waiting for a rating decision, if it was pending anywhere, um, then they do not need to refile. VA should automatically apply these new rules. But if a veteran was denied service connection in the past for any of these claims, then VA is not going to go look through their file and see that they were denied in the past. Those veterans need to file a new claim. So if a veteran, you know, filed a claim for service connection for asthma five years ago, VA is not going to automatically re-adjudicate that just because there's these new rules. That veteran needs to file a new claim, again, seeking service connection for asthma. Because those veterans' claims were denied in the past, they should use the supplemental claim form which is VA form 20-0995 to um, file that claim. Encourage them to file as soon as possible, just because that um, gives them the early po earliest possible date that VA would uh, start paying them if their benefits are granted. Okay, next slide. VA also maintains what's called a burn pit registry. So enrolling in VA's burn pit registry involves filling out an online questionnaire to document their exposure and one free VA health evaluation with a doctor. This can be helpful, um, especially for veterans with limited access to any type of doctor. Um, there's at least this evaluation. Um, so it can be helpful to do, but it's important for veterans to understand participating in this registry does not establish a claim for VA benefits. So even if you know, your online questionnaire confirms you were exposed to burn pits and then that doctor um, diagnoses you with asthma, that's not gonna automatically establish a claim for VA benefits. That veteran would then need to go establish a claim um, with VA, which we'll look about in a couple slides. Um, but it does generate uh, information that could be helpful to support that claim. You know, If the doctor evaluating you gives a diagnosis of a presumptive disease or can help show that the symptoms started um, within that 10 year window. So it can be good evidence just in and of itself. It's not um, a claim for service connection. And again, like I mentioned before, showing exposure in and of itself isn't enough to um, establish a current disability either. So just because a veteran participated in the burn pit registry, if the doctor didn't diagnose anything, then participation in the registry alone doesn't necessarily establish a current disability. On VA's end, they use this registry, they say, to help identify health conditions that are um, popular among veterans who were uh, exposed to burn pits and could potentially um, be another piece of information they use to establish new conditions in the future, uh, which we'll look at in just a second. Uh, next slide. So more help right now, only those three health conditions are the only ones that qualify for presumptive service connection. So that's asthma, rhinitis, and sinusitis. In the passing this new rule, VA indicated that more health conditions may be added to burn presumptions in the future. Um, VA indicated that they're gonna to continue to study additional conditions. They specifically listed as sleep apnea as one of the conditions they're gonna study. I know that's um, another really commonly claimed disability. Um, so that's not a promise that anything's going to happen, but VA said they are still looking at it. Additionally, Congress may act. There's been some interest on the Hill about veterans exposed to burn pits. Um, so there's potential there that more health conditions could be added in the future. But in the meantime, veterans shouldn't wait for their health conditions um, to be added to a presumptive exposure. If a veteran is suffering from any current disability, they should file a claim as early as possible. Um, it helps you know, establish that they could get more money from VA, and it also makes it easier to establish their claim the sooner you file after your separation from service. Um, go ahead on the next slide. So if a veteran has a current health condition that is not one of the three that is VA recognizes as presumptively exposed to burn pits, they can still argue that their other health condition is related to their burn pit exposure. So we talked about there's those two different presumptions. 
Veterans who deploy to any of the countries listed on that earlier slide gets the benefit of exposure to burn pits. So that helps establishing that in-service event happened because they were exposed to burn pits in service. But if it's not those three disabilities of asthma, rhinitis, or sinusitis, if it's anything else, like if it's sleep apnea, that veteran has to establish that their sleep apnea is due to that exposure to burn pits. As we mentioned, that's generally going to require an opinion from a doctor. Um, so there's this case, uh, Polovic, that's up on your screen. It said that the proof um, that non-presumptive service connections are due to presumed exposure should focus on the specific risk factors of the veteran. So really what that means is the doctor should look at, even if VA isn't agreeing that every veteran who is exposed to burn pits um, you know, could result in sleep apnea, the doctor should focus their opinion on why that specific veteran's exposure could have caused their sleep apnea. So those specific risk factors could be like if that veteran's um, barracks was the one closest to the burn pit, so they were you know, just breathing it in all night. Or if their MOS, you know, was involved, them actually being the one to throw things into the fire. Like if they were exposed to the burn pit more even than the average um, soldier who was deployed, that would be relevant. It can also be the absence of other things. Like if a veteran never smoked a cigarette one day in their life, you know, then that takes away um, that as an additional risk factor. So um, you want the, any doctor to focus on the things that are unique about your veteran. Um, and to try to build an argument that their current condition must be due to that exposure to burn pits during service. So, um, like I said, this usually requires a doctor's opinion. VA tends not to uh, just take a veteran's life statements about that. Um, so try to find um, a doctor if the veteran's able, but it does make it harder to show that nexus um, if it's not presumptively service connected. Okay, next slide. I'm going to briefly go over some tips about meeting with an accredited service officer and uh, what it is required to establish your claim for VA benefits. So next slide. <clears throat> so overall, filing a, the right claim the first time is much easier for the veteran to get benefits than spending years trying to appeal a negative VA decision. So our advice would be um, sign up with an accredited service officer from the beginning. You'll be able to get help from an expert then who can help you get um, all the stuff you need to win your claim the first time. Take the time to identify and gather the evidence that you have that's available to you before you file your claim so you're giving as much as possible to VA at the same time. And submit your package using the correct VA forms. VA is increasingly relying on um, forms. It's because internally in their workflow, they're trying to automate as much as they can. So they want things to look the same as they possibly can. So um, forms are just becoming increasingly important in filing claims. So we're going to look at a couple of the big ones and have some tips on um, how to fill those out. So next slide. So the first form we would start with is what's called VA form 2122. This is the form that's also called power of attorney. It's required to receive assistance from any DSO. So to get that expert help on your claim, you need to first fill out this form even before filing uh, your claim or at the same time. I just wanted to note on this form, um, section one is the veteran's information and section two is the claimant. So this is relevant if it's not actually the veteran themselves that's filing for the claim. Say it's a surviving widow who's filing for a claim for VA benefits. Just note on this form, you start with the veteran's information on the top, and then whoever is actually filing the claim, like the surviving widow, would be in section two. Another common error on this form is actually on the VSO side. So box 15 is for the name of the VSO organization, which would be like the California Department of Veterans Affairs. Box 16 is for the name of the individual representative who's filling out the form. So like John Smith, um, we see people sometimes put the name of the VSO organization in both boxes, but box 16 really should be the name of the person filling out the form. Next slide. 
And then just some general expectations for that first meeting with your um, accredited, accredited service officer. So the purpose of that initial interview is both to explain VA's rules and procedures, and that can help set some expectations about uh, VA's timeline, which you know always takes longer than we would all like. It also gives the VSO a chance to assess the strength of your claim to let you have some kind of reasonable expectations about what might be granted and what benefits you may receive. It also lets you build rapport with the, your advocate, which is important because you're going to need to keep working with this person um, and share some, you know, medical information, which can be uncomfortable sometimes. So that relationship is important. Um, they can help you gather information to win, and then together you can plan the next steps. So next slide. Like I mentioned, it helps to identify all of the information up front that you can, so you're giving as much as possible that's relevant to VA the first time. So this includes telling your service officer all of your deployment dates and locations. That can help that expert identify if any of the uh, presumptive service connection could apply for your claims and can make it easier for you to win your claims. Also go over all of your current medical diagnoses and um, all of your symptoms. Again, that expert help might be able even to point out some things that might be related to your service that the veteran themselves isn't really thinking of. And identify, talk about all of your treatment providers, both past and in the present. Um, you know, some doctors you went to, most any time after your separation from service could have some relevant information that it might help to track down records from them. And they also could be a source of those nexus opinions we talked about. So next slide. So then you're ready to prepare your VA claim package. Um, most of the time, you're going to start with the VA form 21526EZ, which we'll go over in the next slide. But also think about you might want to add some things in addition to this claim form, like the release so that VA can obtain any private medical opinion, medical records any statements in support of claim from either the veteran or their loved ones or buddies. Um, so those would be witness statements, other evidence. And then we would always encourage also including written arguments explaining why VA should grant your claim. Uh, so next slide. So the very first time a veteran is filing a claim for any specific type of, be of benefits, um, then they should start with VA form 21526EZ. So this would be their very first claim for VA benefits and also the first time they're seeking service connection for any disability. So if a veteran's already service connected for hearing loss, but now is filing a new claim for asthma, if they've never filed a claim for asthma before, then they would also start with the same form 21526EZ. Part of this form in box four here, the little checkbox that says, have you ever filed a claim in VA before? Um, you can save a lot of processing time by if that veteran has ever filed a claim with VA to check yes in that box, even if that claim was like decades ago. Um, that can help VA like associate their records together and it can really um, just speed up the timeline. So it's an important box to take care of. Uh, next slide. The other really important section of this form is section four, which is the information regarding current claims. So there's those different boxes there. For each claim type, uh, list the disability, whatever happened in service, the in-service event, uh, whatever the relationship is to service, and then the date the disability either started or got worse. Now, if you'll notice, those boxes aren't that big for asking for all of that information that VA is. So you can always um, attach additional pages in addition to this form. So VA makes you use the form, but you can always submit um, your like typed or written letters in addition to this to give yourself some more space to fill out all of this information. And uh, box 17 asks you to list all VA or DA, DOD facilities where the veteran received treatment, include dates and as many of them as you can remember. But you'll notice that this form actually doesn't ask about any private medical records, it's only asking about medical records in control of VA or DOD. If you got relative treatment from, you know, any private uh, normal healthcare facility, uh, next slide. Then you will need to complete a release, which is the VA form 214142A. And again, that blue uh, text will hyperlink to that form for you. 
This is the release for private medical records. So if you complete this, then VA can go get a copy of those records for you on the veteran's behalf. So include the name of the doctor and the facility, and you're going to need to sign the form. Now the veterans could obtain and submit their could obtain the records themselves and submit them to VA directly. Sometimes that's faster um, if the veteran's able just to get their records ahead of time. But um, a lot of private medical centers will charge a fee for getting their records. The fee kind of varies by the facility. Um, and generally VA can get them for free. So just to keep that in mind that there is that difference. Uh, next slide. So I mentioned that you could always uh, submit your own written statements in addition to the forms. You can use any paper you want, but we would actually recommend using this VA form 214138, which is called a statement in support of claim. Now you can see there's like just a big box along the bottom here, basically just for open text that you can write whatever you want. But it's still on a form that's controlled by VA, so VA is more used to looking at it. Um, so it just makes it a little more likely that VA will see it, that like the mailroom people will catch it as, and read it and act on anything that's in there, just to make sure it doesn't get lost in your file, is why we recommend using this form. So we would actually uh, recommend using it every time you're submitting a form uh, or claim for benefits. Like I said, just to give yourself that additional space to explain you know, why you think your disability is due to VA benefits. Um, and this form includes, you know, fill out the top of the form, including the veteran's name, um, social security number, and the date so that those pages don't get lost. Uh, kind of our mantra at the firm is always to say, don't submit a naked claim. Always take the time to explain uh, the reasoning behind uh, why this veteran thinks uh, their claim is related to their service. Um, and again, doing that the first time can really go a long way to help the veteran win their claim initially instead of having to spend a long time trying to fight VA in the appeal system. Next slide. So even after submitting a claim, veterans should continue to remain in contact with their service officer so they can continue to get that expert help. And this involves telling your service officer um, when you get more information from VA. Uh, VA generally mails these things to veterans, like in the snail mail. So be sure to, uh, the VA has your right address and be checking uh, your mail because you can get important information from VA that way. They could send notice that they weren't able to get a copy of any of the records that you identified. Um, and that would be relevant because the veteran maybe should try to get them themselves then. They could send notice that they've scheduled an exam for you. Um, so that needs to show up to this appointment being scheduled. That exam is um, often through a private company now, but they'll also mail the copy of the rating decision to the veteran. Um, if the veteran doesn't win their claims in that rating decision, then you should definitely tell your service officer about them because they could also help you in seeing if you want to dispute or appeal that rating decision. And there's generally a one year time period to be able to do that. So uh, the faster you tell your service officer, the faster they'll be able to help you and uh, make sure you take advantage of that one year time. The next slide. And we've been focusing on compensation claims, but I just wanted to flag that um, the healthcare element of uh, VA benefits is also incredibly important. Generally, veterans have to be service connected in order to receive health care from VA, but there's also a big exception for veterans who were deployed to a period of war. So a lot of the veterans who um, would qualify for these burn pit exposures would also be entitled to, uh, I believe it's usually five years of VA health care um, starting from their date of separation. Um, again, this is something that any service officer would be the expert to help you know what your eligibility is. Um, but we just wanted to flag the form for enrolling in VA healthcare is this form, VA form 1010-AZ. It includes a lot of questions about the veteran service history, their VA disability ratings, their income. That's because VHA uses all of this information to determine the veterans what's called eligibility class. It determines how much healthcare um, they're able to receive from VA. Uh, so there's a lot of questions on this form, um, but it's all relevant information uh, for VA to determine how much healthcare that veteran can get. Right, next slide. 
That was all I had in the presentation, but I'm gonna stick around to see if there's gonna be any questions. But I also just wanna say thank you for inviting us to join you. Uh, I've actually learned a lot about California benefits and uh, it's been great to work with you all. I hope we can keep working together in the future. Great. Thank you so much, Andrea. Such uh, valuable information. We really appreciate your time as well as Bergman and Moore for joining us on this webinar series. It's, uh, it's really an honor to have you guys and thank you so much. Um, so at this time, I believe we are going to transition into our Q&A portion of the presentation. Um, I will um, defer to my colleague, Kirk, who has been monitoring the chat box uh, to go over any questions that we had throughout the presentation. So Kirk, if you would like to facilitate that, um, sure, Derek. Take it away. Thank you. Um, uh, please, everyone, bear with me. Our this is a different platform for our questions, so I have to scroll back and forth in the chat to get some of the previous questions. So uh, it may take me a little bit of time, but we'll try to get all of your questions answered as best we can. Uh, Andrea, I do appreciate you staying on to uh, answer some of the questions. So let me scroll back uh, to the beginning. Uh, so there was a couple uh, asking for how do you contact some of the county veteran offices? I did post in the chat some of the links for contacting and locating our county offices. Um, the first question will be, uh, let's see. Okay, I believe, how do we know if the ailment that we suffer from is on the presumptive list of ailments? Yeah, that's a good question. And that's really an example of when an accredited BSO can help you out because um, they have that expert information. Um, it's also an, another reason, as I mentioned, it's worth telling your uh, accredited BSO all of the symptoms and medical conditions you have because they might know that some of those are on the presumptive list, um, even if the veteran themselves isn't really thinking of it as connected to service. Um, and these lists can change over time, like these burn pits are new. So um, yeah, my best advice would be just to seek out an accredited BSO with that question. Okay, great, thank you. Um, hopefully that answered the question. The next one, um, obviously would documented difficulty breathing be one of those presumptive conditions on that list? So difficulty breathing in and of itself is not um, a diagnosis that's gonna qualify for the presumption at this point. It's really only a diagnosis of asthma, rhinitis and sinusitis. But that's definitely a relevant symptom. Um, that is something that could be due to burn pit exposure. Um, so it's it potentially um, without a diagnosis that veteran is going to need to establish the nexus. And if it's just the symptoms of impair of difficulty breathing, they would need to um, establish the functional impairment from that symptom. So you know, the difficulty breathing means you can't walk as far or uh, something. Add that extra step if there's not the diagnosis yet. Okay. Now the next one is um, any information regarding the tainted anthrax vaccine used in 2006 or any information or contact related issues? So that's nothing that's like presumptive yet. Um, I'm not sure I know all of the details either about what they're referencing, but that seems like um, that would be a theory to establish really direct service connection. So you would be arguing um, any, any vaccination that happened in service would be your in-service event, and then you would need to establish the nexus because there's nothing presumptive addressing that yet. Okay, sure. Uh, next one, uh, this person 100% rated, but has 0% rating for sinusitis uh, and chronic allergies. Is it advisable to I'm assuming there's a change their claim, uh, don't want to affect my already 100% rating. Oh no, you broke up a little bit on my end. I don't know if it's okay, my problem. So they're or asking, they have a 100% service connected disability rating already, uh, but the part of their rating is already based on sinusitis at 0% and chronic allergies. Is it advisable to adjust their claim? Uh, they don't want to affect their 100% rating. Oh, okay. So if um, the presumptive service connection is only to get them to service connection, it doesn't change their rating. Um, so if your symptoms got worse, then you could pursue an increased rating. Um, the strategy about whether that would impair your 100% rating is really getting kind of in the weeds of fact specifics. So that would be something to discuss with um, an accredited BSO. 
Mm -hmm. This new presumptive uh, rules only relates to service connection. It doesn't change the rating for those disabilities. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and then CVSO locations. Um, the next one is uh, the burnout presumption for those of us that were in Afghanistan, Qatar, and Uzbekistan, where uh, this uh, documents, they burn documents, uh, lived in tent less than 80 yards from those burn pits in 2004. Signs of probably symptoms on return, but attributed them to being out of shape. Uh, did not get diagnosed with asthma until 2018. Is there any hope for my claim? So it sounds like your diagnosis was more than 10 years after your separation from the most relevant period of service. Um, but that's not fatal to your claim. You need to establish, though, that the symptoms started within mm -hmm. those, that 10 year window. So if you had symptoms of difficulty breathing within those 10 years, um, right. you need to just show that those same symptoms are what later got diagnosed as the asthma. Okay, thank you. Um, the next one is, you've already addressed this one about the formal diagnosis for difficulty breathing. Um, the next one is currently service connected at 0% for rhinitis. What do I need to show to push that to 10%? Mm. Again, that's, that's ratings um, are not impacted by these new presumptive rules. Um, so nothing's changed about the uh, rating criteria. Um, I don't have it in front of me right now. Again, that's a question that an accredited service officer could help you with, but the rules for ratings have not changed. These are just new rules about establishing service connection. Okay. Uh, the next one uh, is sleep apnea. Um, have sleep apnea after a tour in Iraq but I cannot connect sleep apnea with my service only as a secondary issue. Can this go hand in hand? Yeah, like I said, VA even acknowledged that sleep apnea is one of the ones they're looking at. So I think there's maybe hope they create a presumptive connection eventually, um, but not yet. So right now you would still have to be proving um, all three elements to show that your sleep apnea is due to your in-service exposure to burn pits. Okay. Uh, next question is, being exposed in any area during time and service, will this be an eligible claim? Is it an eligible claim? I, I don't know um, which area they're specifically asking about. It just says in area during time and service will be able to file a claim. Yeah, so... Um... The veterans in those specific countries that were listed on that slide in that time frame are the ones who are presumed exposed to burn pits. Right. I wouldn't be surprised VA used burn pits in areas outside of those countries. Mm -hmm. um, so those veterans in places other than those countries wouldn't be presumed exposed to burn pits. They would have to put forward evidence showing they were in fact exposed to burn pits. Um, so you would just you know, need to explain, witness them, whatever evidence you could put forward. Okay. Derek, did you want to chime in on anything? Yeah, I just have a little follow-up to that question, only because I've I've actually received it a few times on our end. Um, this may be in relation a little bit more specifically to those who have served in the United States Navy. So, for example, if they were like permanently stationed stateside in San Diego or Virginia, but they went on, let's say, six-month deployments to the theater in, in Middle East or Bahrain or, you know, Kuwait or something along those lines and you know, they had a few port calls in the area or, you know, we're only there for a short period of time, but they actually do have a current diagnosis of something along the lines of chronic fatigue or irritable bowel. Um, would, if, as long as they have those diagnoses, does like the time that they actually spent in theater or the fact that they just kind of rolled through on a Navy deployment, would they still have a chance for a successful claim in relation to presumptive conditions as opposed to just you know, being permanently stationed or permanently deployed in that theater? That's a good question. Yeah, absolutely. There is not a temporal requirement on these presumptions of exposure. Um, so the way that the regs are written, it says if you serve there at all uh, during that, those, any of those countries, um, you know, after that specific date. So uh, that would, and especially the Gulf War service specifically includes a couple bodies of water. Um, so for any veteran who went in those bodies of water, that counts. And then, yes, like you mentioned, port calls, um, you know, on land uh, would count as service um, in that country. There's not like 
X amount of days required. Um, now, if their records don't show that they were deployed there, they might need to gather a little more evidence to show that like their ship actually stopped um, at a port call in one of those countries. So it might just take a little more steps of gathering evidence, but uh, once you should be served there at all, then it counts for the presumption of exposure. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. Um, okay, next question. Uh, this is Calvet. Uh, does Calvet assist with any SSDI? Um, I'm assuming that that's like state disability um, claims or anything like that. Uh, that would be most likely through the EDD office, I believe. Um, the State Employment Development Department is who covers the state disability. Annette, you worked at EDD. I believe that's probably in your wheelhouse. Yes, um, actually, yeah, you, uh, you can actually, the AJCCs where the, um, the vet reps are located from EDD, uh, mm -hmm. They have a computer. You can go in there. They can assist you with filing either for a paid family leave disability, uh, state disability, or unemployment. So they're there to assist you. And you can also contact your EDD vet rep if you need more information on how to do that. Yeah. And uh, for veterans that are, you know, trying to get information through EDD, I do recommend using a veteran's uh, representative, whether a DVOP or a lever, because they can assist you far beyond what a normal a uh, veteran or a normal EDD representative can. There's a lot more benefits there involved. So yeah. the next question, uh, hopefully that answered their question. The next one is, uh, uh, this is kind of uh, individualized um, for that person. Um, uh, their diagnosis, um, how do I get this changed if they had a diagnosis of a non-service related issue, but uh, it states they had some issues in the past due to exposure. How do they get it changed? And I think you're gonna continue on going to the County Veteran Office, have them reassess your claim and look at uh, what you can file. I believe that's uh, where our baseline is gonna be with that one, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's hard to answer too specifically, but um, like I said, the, the key to getting the benefit of the presumption is showing that your symptoms started within 10 years of separation from the period that had qualifying service. So, okay. um, you know, the, the period of service started so long ago that some people might already be well past those 10 years. Um, so you're going to just need to go back and find evidence that your symptoms started then, even if you weren't diagnosed yet. And then, um, you know, the A plus evidence would be showing that those symptoms are the same symptoms that later got diagnosed as asthma or rhinitis or sinusitis. Okay. Thank you. And I apologize, you know, we're trying to be as generic as we can with some of the questions, you know, we don't want to put too much personal information out there, um, especially medical related issues. So yeah, no, and I understand it. And yeah, it's you know, uh, so answer more specific questions, but a lot of course, of and that's what we, we you know, if you have a specific question to your individual claim, um, you know, we highly recommend that you contact your county veteran office directly or another representative that can assist you for your individual needs. So, uh, but some general questions we can have. So um, this person trouble logging in because the earthquake, uh, yes, we are going to uh, load this video as soon as we can when our comms division has uh, the recording of this video, this webinar. Uh, I'm not sure when they will be able to upload it. Uh, we'll try to get it up there as soon as we can. And I will put the uh, link in the chat again so that you can access it on our archived webinars. Uh, and I will also put the slide presentation in a PDF form uh, in this chat right now so that you can access these slides for later reference as well. Um, hopefully that will assist you and the link for the ch um, archived webinars will be coming up shortly. Okay, so the next question is, um, okay, let's see. Uh, if a veteran made a claim and it's been denied, will they file both forms, the 995 and the 21526EZ, especially if they're filing a new claim or refile for an old that is presumptive at the same time? So this can get really confusing. VA has made the rules get confusing about which uh, forms sure. are needed to establish a new claim. Um, so if your claim was denied in the past, then you will need the 995 the, to be submitting for the same benefit that was denied in the past. Okay. The new disability that you haven't claimed before, 
um, then you need the 526. Um, so if you were denied for one of the presumptive ones in the past, if you claimed asthma years ago, um, but now it's presumptive and you're filing a claim again, that would be on the 995 because um, you're claiming for the same disability. If you're in doubt, I think the question was, what about if you're filing some that are brand new and some that you claimed in the past before? I would use both forms um, just to cover your bases so that VA can't say that you, know, you didn't submit the one you were supposed to. Um, VA won't like that advice because they don't want multiple forms, but you know what? I want to protect the veteran and get their effective date as early as possible. So um, if, if you're in doubt and you're confused, I would actually uh, just recommend submitting them both uh, to cover your bases. But okay. again, an accredited VSO could help you out because VA has made this very confusing now. Yeah, I understand. It's very, it's, sometimes it's very difficult, especially when it comes. That's why we do recommend to use a accredited VSO uh, to the, go through this process because they are the experts. And not only that, if there is a deny, denial, they can assist you with any claims going forward or refiling another claim. So uh, please contact a, an accredited VSO for filing your claims. So, okay, the next question, um, and we're getting close here. Um, if a disabled veteran was able to be fully employed, will this information be uh, the basis of granting or denying a veteran a disability claim? I don't, I don't think there is any connection with that, but I'll let you answer that one. Yeah, so um, it's a little hard to answer generally. Most claims, uh, your employment status actually doesn't matter. Um, so, you know, if you're diagnosed with a disability and it's related to service, then there's, you know, the schedule laid out in the, um, in the regulations that is the ratings you receive. Now, there's certain claims that it will matter. It, it does kind of impact if the veteran's working or not. That's specifically your psych claims and claims for total disability based on individual unemployability or IU. Um, so there is some specific benefits where that matters, but for um, most service-connected disabilities, uh, whether the veteran's working or not doesn't impact their rating. Okay. Um, this person asked um, a preference if they wanted to go see their personal doctor or a VA doctor. I think that's a personal preference question, I think, there. If... Yeah, um, you know, it is, it can be difficult to get nexus opinions. So whichever doctor is willing to work with you, I would go to that one, right? So if that is your personal doctor or your VA doctor, um, you know, anybody who's willing to work with you to establish, uh, to get that kind of opinion is, is gonna be the most help. Okay. And please bear with me. Um, my chat is froze again. Can you hear me, Andrea? I can hear you. Oh, I think you just got muted. Hey, Kirk, can you hear me okay? Kirk, I think we lost you there uh, for a second. Um, so with that, I, I think we've probably about come to our, our time frame um, to conclude. So Kirk, I really appreciate you facilitating, facilitating that on your end. Um, Andrea as well, thank you for your time and taking the time to answer some of those questions. And I know this this topic, right? It could we could really get into the weeds with, with everything and everybody's circumstance. But we just want to um, present this information on the screen to you. So if you'd like to reach out a little bit more directly um, to allow us to follow up with you, if you have any questions on related to the content of this webinar or anything that CalTap or CalVet can do to assist you, please take a screenshot of this information and feel free um, to reach out to us later. Um, we'd also like to highlight our series of upcoming webinars that we're going to be hosting throughout the remainder of the month. Um, some of those archived webinars that I mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, as well as some of the ones coming up in November. As you can see, some of them are very topic specific, um, you know, related to our, our whole series of online webinars. So we encourage you to, to follow us and stay, stay uh, in tune with everything that we have going on through our event rights and social media platforms. Um, and our CalVet website as well. Um, we'd like to give you our email address one more time. 
as well as uh, we do uh, request that you take our um, survey for today's event to kind of give us your feedback. We really do use the information in there to make sure that we're presenting um, most relevant and up-to-date information that best serves veterans as well as their family members. So um, with that, if there's uh, not anything else, I'd like to thank everybody for your service, for your time. Um, wish you all a good rest of your day. Stay safe and stay healthy. And we hope to see you again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.